It's 9am and Bolton steeplejack Fred Dibner arrives at a demolition site near Monton in Manchester. The chimney Fred is working on today is approximately 100 feet high and to prepare it for demolition has taken Fred a week. He starts by knocking out the bricks at the base of the chimney. In the spaces left by the bricks are inserted measured pieces of old telegraph pole. In this way the chimney is supported. Yeah, you see, before we actually remove this slit of brickwork out of the bottom, we, we drill two holes in the, you know, one at bottom there and one and one in the wall there, and then set this instrument to the distance of, you know, the two holes are apart, and then proceed to remove the brickwork and prop it up with the props. And sort of as you, you're going round, you see, it's feeling the pain, the wall thing. And this gap is actually shutting up, it's a bit like being down pit. And then eventually you get to a stage where the two points will not fit in the holes. As you can see here, it's half an inch out of going in that hole, which means that this gap is now half an inch less than what it was when we first made it, which means that the wall thing is leaning this way, you see. And then also around the back, there is a, a, an horizontal crack in a bed joint which is more or less in line with the top of this cut along here, you see. The, the, one of them, uh, and, and a big chimney, a bigger chimney than this. <laughs> There's a couple of blokes hanging about here, <coughs> looking with the props. Yeah. Were the so, young ones or what? Oh, about, in, well, one was about 22. Oh, they, they, lived on the, they lived on the estate oh, here yeah, somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I said, what are you doing? She said, well, we're just looking. I said, what are you doing? Pulling the props. Yeah, yeah. Shaking yeah. the props. I said, yeah. he could shake them away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, no, they'll, they'll have a job, pull them out now. I know, but... There's plenty of weight on them. Without that, they know, yeah, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. last night, I had a load of yob, you know. Mm, bits of kids, like. Yeah. Lads, about 18, 20. Yeah. All had a drink, you know what yeah, I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah, Had a yeah, drink, yeah, hanging yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. The site where the chimney is to fall is clear and made level so that when the chimney does fall, the flying bricks and mortar are kept to a minimum. You're in. Oh, you're right there.
This job presents a real conflict for Fred, who would much rather be building or repairing a chimney than demolishing one. For Fred, the workmanship that has gone into building a monument like this should be kept forever, and he feels much sadness at its loss. Yeah, this, this crack, you see, you know, is telling us that the thing's definitely feeling the pain to go the right way, you know, there's no way, not a chance in one million that the thing will go over there towards the canal, you know, so we've really no worries, you know, the job's over with as far as uh, chopping the brickwork away at the other side. All as we've got to do is hammer a crowbar in there and watch the end of it, and when there's thousand movement on that crack, the end of the crowbar, which will be over there, will start going down and I will know when to blow me out and retire to a safe place. Hopefully. It's now time to build a bonfire. Where's these bloody rubber tyres, you know? Oh, they're here, aren't they? Mm. Yeah, no then. After Fred and assistant Neil put the final chock into the chimney, a bonfire of wood and rubber tyres is built around the outside. Fred does things the traditional way, and for him it's the best way. He's perfected his technique over the years. Have you not felt this chimney yet? How many more have we got? The Whitworth one, I mean. Yeah, I'm just on with it now. Uh, just give us a lift with this ray on top of here, if we can get it on. Just uh, like that, stuck under there. That's it. Uh, Most demolition men today use explosives, but Fred will not hear of it. He feels his way is safer, less costly, and more fitting to monuments of British history. Old pallets and pieces of wood that have been collected from the site are used as the bonfire builds higher. Various. There's, there's precious little literature on the subject of steeplejacking, but there are one or two <coughs> books uh, long gone out of print, you know, with pictures in the 1890s of men doing work like this, you see, with propping them up on sticks. And the reason for this is, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, when there were small steam engines and small boiler plants, and they were still growing, you know, the, the surge for power. And they got bigger chimneys and bigger steam engines and newer and better premises. Uh, somebody had got to get rid of the chimneys that were built in the 1840s and 18, you know, 50s period, which that's where this method were developed, um, of, you know, putting, propping them up on sticks and setting fire to them. But some say, and I have read in another Greek mythology book that Joshua and the walls of Jericho you know the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down what they actually did were tunnel underneath and prop them up on sticks and set fire to the bloody things you know and that's how the walls came tumbling down <laughs> same principle finally agricultural diesel is doused onto the bonfire to soak into the wood prior to the lighting First time, I think. Yeah, that's really late. The exciting bit. <laughs> it's now 10:30 a.m., and a crowd of expectant people gather around the site. It usually takes about 20 minutes from the lighting of the fire to the chimney hitting the ground. Fred openly admits that this can be a tense time.
They came to see a spectacle and they weren't disappointed. Fred picks up his bits and pieces and is on his way for a well-deserved pint to clear the dust. Well, no, what it is, it'd be somebody who, who spends all his life reading paper about the, the ozone layer and all that, and he'd be watching out of his bedroom window, and he'd, God, you know, I must inform the authorities. And he'd be, the phones would be red hot, you know, sometimes if we'd done one in country and we've never bothered telling Fire Brigade, They'd, they'd, they'd be ringing fire brigade up at only Lancaster, 20 mile away. They're coming like 100 mile an hour down the road and they get there and the chimney's off the road. It's always a picturesque sight to see traction engines on the road. Fred often takes his 1912 Aveling and Porter road roller to traction engine rallies and is today on his way to Astle Park for the annual steam rally and get together. Fred's road roller was originally named Allison after Fred's first wife. But following their divorce, the engine has been renamed Betsy after his mother because Fred feels mothers are more constant and reliable. Steam traction engines have to make regular stops to fill their water tanks. Many drivers, as they travel along, stop to fill up with water at fire hydrants, which are found along the roadside. OK then, Fred, turn it on. It's a stiff one, isn't it? I think it's uh, coming down the pipe now. We'll soon be with you. <laughs> It's a good kink, isn't it, there? Mm. Here she comes. The pressure can't be very great, or it, Here would, she it would fire Here she through. Comes. I can a bit faster than that, To take water it? this way is technically illegal. That's better. Fred considers he's doing a public service by testing the hydrant and unblocking it, as he explains. You're doing the local water authority a service and the fire brigade as well, because imagine if your house were over there and, and sometimes these hydrants are full up to the top with muck, you know, and when we stop, we've got to dig all the muck out before we can get some water out of it. And if your house were burning down day after, and the fire, you know, the fire brigade arrived and, it, and we hadn't stopped there before, the, you know, the, the precious minutes wasted <laughs> when all your valuables were being melted down, you see. The, the thing is, uh, I, I, I can't see why anybody should argue, you know, about us just pinching a few gallons of water. I mean, we're very good for the tourist trade as well. And also, sort of, you know, the, the lad who just gone by with his engine, he, he were in the middle of Lancaster one day and he, he snapped one open and the top come off. And it was belting up in the sky about 20 feet, you know, and so <laughs> water everywhere. Sent him a bill for 20 quid, I think, or something. Yeah. Testing, we'll send our report to the fire brigade. Right, take off.
Fred loves an excuse to take his traction engine out on the road and enjoys the journey to the rally as much as the rally itself. He bought his Avery and Porter steamroller in 1966 from a Welsh scrap merchant for £175. It weighs 13 tonnes and took many years to restore to its former glory. There are a great many traction engines and exhibits at Astle Park this year, and whenever you see Fred, he's usually accompanied by his young son, Jack. Already, Jack is showing a keen interest in steam engines, and perhaps, with a little prompting from his father, will follow in his footsteps. Spoke riveting yeah. was done hot. It was done yeah. by hand. I didn't oh, use yeah. a power tool. No, no. Use yeah, a big, you. a big hammer. Yeah, but, uh, you, you, but it was well a job. Well, huh? I, yeah. I must have chose one of the hottest days of the summer to do it last yeah, year yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, it's not much fun, is it? The riveting job. No, no, it ain't. No. And firebox is that all? You know, done like a proper one. You know. No, it's welded. It's, the yeah. whole boiler is welded. Yeah, uh, yeah. And the rivets mm. that you can see on the side there, yeah. they are dumb. It's just for yeah, the effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they get it. They've gone a bit weird, haven't they? Boiler job, aren't they? Well, it's insurance. insurance, it's insurance yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah. All the all the rivets are on the front of the engine. Yeah. They're, they're all operational. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they were done hot so, as well. So the blocks are bonny yeah. job, then. How, how, yes. how did you manage that? Well, it was it was a, a casting that, that, that was available, so yeah. I didn't have to do the casting. Mm. But, but some of the machining I could do, some of you yeah. couldn't. So mm. yeah. uh, I've got a friendly engineering company to do some of the yeah. big machining yeah. for me. There's yeah. plenty of them about, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Well, when they see what you're doing, they, mm. they, they're quite happy to give you a lift a lot That's of right. Them, oh, yeah. I've yeah. experienced that lots of times yeah. in my uh, little efforts, you know. And I think it's your approach to people as well, you know. Yeah. If you approach yeah. them in the right manner and yeah. Uh, yeah. don't give them any... Yeah, no flannel. They, they, they tend to respond to yeah, you. Yeah, what you've got. Uh, I made a fatal mistake a week or two back. I had gear gear selector off my tractor, Aye. and um, I thought I'll get the, the spindles metal sprayed. Yes. And I walked in with it under my arm, and they were yeah. having the brew, you know. And, and, he, and the bloke who were in charge, he said that looks like an expensive job. Aye. And I said, well, I've no bloody money, you know. And then he went off me after that. Ah, well, <laughs> yeah. they, they, they do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, are, should... they either go that way yeah, or, yeah, or you yeah. go oh, in with, it's, uh... if you go in with the wad sometimes yeah, yeah, that works. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Easy done. He 
he's a good singer, isn't he? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, he's uh, quite a boy, eh? a bit of a wisecracker. I'm getting too old for it, really, you know. It's sort of um, the first 20 years are the worst. Such dirty things and all, and spew muck everywhere. As soon as you finish cleaning it, it's bad again after the first journey. So why do you do it then? Oh, well, I like it. It's sort of a, a love-air relationship. <laughs> During the night, there's been persistent rain, which has made the ground quite muddy and slippery. These are not ideal conditions for manoeuvring a steamroller out of the field, but Fred, with his usual confidence, manages to get Betsy rolling to start his long journey back to Bolton. The start of another busy day. Fred and his young son, Jack, arrive to service a stationary steam engine. Before servicing the engine, they have to get steam up. Yeah. To reach the right pressure usually takes about an hour yeah, and a half. Well, it's a bit too big now. Yeah. Fred and Jack stoke the boiler with chopped wood to get a good blaze going. Governors, yes. This lad knows, he knows all about governor. <laughs> the governors. <laughs> yeah. Good lad. Good lad. You can do with getting an old vacuum cleaner like that Neil lad, you know. It's, they're handy then for sucking up uh, stuff, you know. Over the years, Fred has gained experience in restoration work. Much of what he knows has become a dying art, so typically, Fred has perfected these skills of another era, Victorian steam. Now, he's much sought after for his expertise. A really big and well-paid job came when he was asked to give his opinion on a price quoted for the restoration of this stationary steam engine. Outspoken as always, Fred said he thought it was far too much money and promptly said he'd do it for considerably less money and still make a profit. Half buried and left to rot, this engine was left derelict on a landed estate near Carnarvon and had not been in use since 1931. The engine looked like a piece of useless rust of the type you'd expect to see in any scrapyard. The roof had caved in and mixed amongst the erosion of rust were found pigeon droppings of many years and old lime chippings of plaster off the crumble engine house walls. Many would have turned their backs on the idea of restoring something so daunting, but in Fred's mind could be seen the engine fully restored with gleaming brass, bright paintwork, hissing and sighing as it moved backwards and forwards on well-oiled bearings. Built in 1854 by uh, Mr. D. Winton in Carnarvon for his lordship, I've forgotten his name, you know, the bloke who used to live here, because I'm a stranger myself, you see. The, the thing is, it, 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 initially, it's, it's sort of performance were working a big saw next door, sawing tree, you know, trees up. 
Uh, but about 1931, as far as we can work out, they just give it up as a bad job, you know, and it's been here, like it on that photograph on wall there, just rotting peacefully, you know, with that, that wind that had broken and the rain coming down all over it. And two years ago, I, you know, I came here to do up the chimney stack, which of course is just outside in that passageway. Um, and, and when they told me how much, you know, they'd been uh, quoted for doing it up, uh, I thought, oh God, you know, I can do a, you know, if not a better job for a bloody half the price, you know, so I ended up getting a job. Uh, and it took me two years, actually, from, if you look at them photographs up there, and yeah. see what the thing were like, you know, I mean, you have seen better things in scrapyards than what, you know, what it was. But I'm glad I did it, because it's a, it's a nice engine, you know, it's, uh, I think, I think, like, they must have tried a bit harder, because it were for the nobility, you see, than, than the, hello, oh, my mate, uh, is the boiler all right? Mm. Shall we have a go at making it go round, you know? Fred opens the valve and engages the steam, which sets the engine into motion. Yeah, all right, mate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll get the governor's. The engine is now running we'll smoothly and contentedly, out. having been well serviced and looks as good as the day it was made. I don't think he'd ever had a, a great deal of uh, overuse, you know, the were on it were. On the main bits that are generally very worn on a steam engine, they were in quite good order. The vandal really had done more harm to it with the big hammer trying to get the brass off it. Like that thumping inside, I think that's the piston rings on the, on the piston being a bit slack, you know, uh, it generally sounds like that, but it's no detriment to it. Though. There's no knocks outside, you know, that's the... Uh, uh. At the other side of this wall, there's a, a timber store, and then at the other side of that, there's the, where the sawmill were. And the shaft went straight through the timber store to where the saw it, where remains of it is still there. But they scrapped it in 1931 and got some modern electrical equipment, driven by electric motors, you know. Come on, Jack. Let's go home now. We've got enough material. Come on, dear. Some hinges on this gate. This is this is the first hole. Drilled in the bottom of the chimney. It's amazing, really, when you come when you come mending a chimney. This is the first thing you do, and the last thing you do, <laughs> apart from pulling rope off top. Fred's assistant, Neil, ties ropes with special knots for safety to the bottom of the ladder. Through the knots, he threads masonry hooks, which later will be knocked into the holes, which Fred has already made in the chimney, to hold the ladder whilst Fred climbs to the top. Each time a ladder is extended, the same procedure is followed. Thus, the ladder is held firmly in place. Right. Up the apples and pears we go. Wait a minute. The mortar is very good, you know, on this chimney. Quite hard, that. I remember knocking. Uh, Knocking top off it, it were a tough, tough business.
In this instance, there's a school right next door to where Fred is working, and the children in the playground are fascinated by Fred's climb. The children's teacher, recognising Fred Dibner, the famous steeplejack, grabs the opportunity to watch Fred in action in real life and allows the children to draw pictures of him as he climbs the chimney. I wonder if they will remember him as the years go by. Two thirds of the way up, Fred looks like a small gnome climbing up the chimney into the sky. A great deal of concentration is needed to maintain his balance on the ladders. Meanwhile, the children are still completely fascinated. Fred has reached the top of the chimney. What do you see, Fred Dibner, as you dream? Do you see days long past when the landscape was scattered with mills and chimneys? The streets heaving and clattering as the mass mill population came to the end of their day and drifted off to their homes close by the mill. Piston rods, flywheels, drive belts and a forge, all driven by steam energy. This is Fred Dibner's workshop developed through years of experience to become a unique place of steam-driven activity. I often do jobs for my friends on, on their engines when they're a bit stuck and, and uh, here we're, we're retubing this little steam tractor in readiness for a trip over the mountains into Yorkshire for the, for the Manchester to Arrogate vintage vehicle run next weekend. And I think it's first time that a traction engine's ever done it. Uh, so I've got to get it right for next Friday. And here we are expanding the tunes, which the thing that we stick down the end is the piece of iron termed as the dolly. <laughs> and you keep knocking till it hits the square. That last shock, it drops out. But I'm frightened to knock it. That's why we're knocking it out with the iron rod. If it, if it hits hard up, uh, it's sort of that little bit of boom and it drops out. But it, it, with the shoulder being rounded off, it could end up opening the end of the tube out, you see, which we don't want. Well, not in, not in the wrong place, like so. When we put the tube expanders in and they start, you know, if all the tube starts going round, you're in trouble, why? But there's no way these are going to go round because they're just, they're just that nice, got a nice grip in the tube, in the firebox end. And all. In fact, they're a good fit in every end, you know, the expanding we did at the front is also a good fit, you know. It, normally, you stick them up the hole and you can wabble them about sort of style. Um, with just what you might call got it right. Another day, and Fred is going to deliver the repaired steam engine he was working on yesterday. It took Fred 14 years of hard work and unsociable hours, not to mention being constantly broke and a failed marriage, all to restore his steam-driven road roller. During those years of constant graft, Fred was to learn a lot about his own capabilities and gain knowledge about steam-driven machinery. He also learnt the art of restoring or repairing steam engines. In fact, it was during this time that it dawned on Fred that he may be able to put what he had learnt to profitable use. He's now well known throughout the steam world for his expertise in steam driven engines. And what used to be a hobby is now a nice little sideline to his steeplejack business. Fred has developed a tow pole out of scaffolding, boring each end to affix the ends to the front end of the steam engine and the back end of the Jeep. 
Before setting off on the journey back to its owner, Fred and Neil must make sure the engine is stoked up with coal and that there's plenty of water in the tanks and that the engine is well oiled. After all, when an engine has been repaired to perfection, it must complete its journey as it left the workshop. Everything tests OK. Steam has built up and the engine is ready to move off. Fred, Neil and Jack set off on the beginning of their journey. Up the hill, through the yard, avoiding cars, washing lines and spectators.
the steam for a real way. There's no way you can see it in, in two or three days. You know, you need top side of a week, I reckon, to examine everything thoroughly and, and, and have a good go at it. Um, and you can literally see it from, from 10 mile away, you know. Uh, it, it, uh, if, well, you know, I've like approached it when you can see it from miles and miles away. Um, I'm supposed to be helping Mr. Fag when I get around to it. You know, I oh, keep yeah. getting him well laid, yeah. Oh. And you got it finished at last, eh? The, uh, yours, yeah. it's a nice job, man, isn't it? You like them round rods, they're nice, then, aren't they? I didn't think he only had a lathe that uh, yeah. Marshall said. <laughs> oh, How's the old boy, the, you know, well, he was coming down. colonel or, or brigadier or whatever, you know. He, he was coming, but he yeah. wasn't very well, apparently. No, yeah, I, I read that somewhere, uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. he didn't bring the showman's this time? Well, we get covered with dust, won't it, on here? <laughs> uh, well, it usually gets covered with dust or with uh, mud. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're going to Wadgeton next yeah. weekend, up by Ellsbury. Yeah. Mm. We had a funny experience last night. We were wandering our weary way home from the beer tent and uh, Dr Giles' remains oh, came yeah. steaming across in his pyjamas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'd been called out for somebody who got some muck in their eye. Oh, and he'd, uh, oh, well, he's a good fellow. It, 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 like, it was like Rip Van Winkle, you know, the <laughs> bloke in striped pyjamas with cord hanging down uh, from you know. Oh, he's a good lad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, well, wonderful weather for it, though. Yeah, it? oh, aye, yeah, it's not going to rain, is it? Where's George on, is he? Uh... He's coming tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've yeah. been the boy. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I better. Has he got his metal polish out, Mr. Fag? I think I'd better go and have a save here. Well, I bet he's done that. Yeah, yeah, well, no, he's not done it all. He's, uh, I'm going to have an outdo, yeah. mate. Where's know? your caravan then, Fred? Oh, it's way yeah. over there, you know. Um, yeah. You know. Probably see yeah. you this evening then. Yeah, are you going in the beer tent? Oh, yeah. sure, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You get yeah. thirsty when you get there, it's a long yeah. way away. Yeah, oh, that's a fact, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'll see, you, I'll see you in a bit, Jack. OK, all, all right, the best, Fred. Yeah. Nice yeah. I've nearly come to dying twice in all my 20 odd years of, uh, well, nearly 30 years of climbing up chimneys. And this chimney stack, when we went to look at it, it was completely surrounded at the bottom with, with well, shrubbery, you know. Yeah. Well, the uh, pussy willow trees and, and blackberry bushes lapped all around it. Yeah. And you couldn't really get near it. Anyway, one would bloody acted all, all the undergrowth down. And we got to the bottom of the chimney. When you look through the flue hole, that's where the smoke used to go into it. All round the inside at the bottom, it was full of water in the bottom, like a well. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, all the brickwork were eroded away, and the wall had gone from like two foot six thick yeah. down to nine inches. You know, it had gone like from that thick of a chimney, you know, to nine inches. So that's a hell of a lot of bloody weight pressing on, on this nine inch wall all the way around the bottom. And of course, the thing was about 160 feet high. And the, 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 what I've got to worry about is, Already on the grass in, in what had been all the undergrowth around the bottom, there were faces off bricks, you know, with the pressure downwards, boom, you know, it had blown bits off the outside, you see. And you think, bloody hell, you know, if I, there's the chimney standing there like this. If I start to chop an hole in this side, the pressure on the brickwork around the bike will become greater and greater as you are cutting and putting your props in, it's still going a lot more weight on bike than there is on the timber, you see. Yeah. And, and it's getting to the stage where I'm thinking, well, even though there were miles off halfway mark, it's so weak down below in the water that it's going to go, you know, it's going to crunch, you know, the crunch the bricks up that I've not cut out, you see. So the old boy who were helping me, he was like knocking, coming up to 70, you know, and I can run a lot faster than him. And, <laughs> and so I said to him, Luke, you send him go, in there? Go, no, I did a no. no. I said to him, look, Gordon, you, you go over there and get out where work compressor is and yeah. with about three lines of bloody pipe on compressor because I didn't know which way it was going to go, you know. All as I knew, you know, you're going to run, but it's going to be hard to run. The thing is, on this side, there were a brick kiln with trees six inches diameter growing on top of it. So you could tell it hadn't been a brick kiln for the last bloody 40 years, you know. It, that side of it, where the clay pit had been, there were a big fence up that had 
red skull and crossbone signs all around the top of it because they filled it up with some highly toxic stuff and put some topsoil on and they'd surrounded it with this bloody oasis kept sinking in it and all, you know, donkey plunkers. They, so I couldn't run that way, I couldn't climb on the brick hill and that way were an impenetrable bloody blackberry bushes and all that. Behind it were the scrapyard from a forge, all lumps of iron and piles of cinders and all sorts of bloody rubbish in way. So it's a bit worrying, you know, which way you're going to run if it's heading for you, you know, sort of thing. The thing is that I'm stood round this side and the bum fire's in front and we let the fire round here and I said to Gordon, you bugger off over there and I'll light the fire here and, and I'll keep chiselling while it's advancing round this way, the fire. And it had got to the stage where the heat of the fire were burning my leg, you know, still bloody drilling away at the brickwork. And when it's going to go, this big vertical cracks appear in the masonry, you know, in the brickwork. And you can see yeah, them. yeah. Oh, you took, put chisel on wall and just pull trigger, bang, once, and this crack will start, you know. Instead of, if it were a garden wall, you'd knock a quarter of a brick out, like, well, these are going, like, three feet long, right upside a chimney, you know. And it's, it's going, you know, like, it's going to go, you know, so. And I backed up and fell down this bloody hole four foot deep, you know, sort of full of water. Oh. And what it were, were, like, the chimney were there and the brick kiln were here, like I said. The flue went underground, and it was one of these types of flues that went right round bottom of the chimney and went in through slits, you see. And of course, that all that had collapsed, so we could see inside where the water were. But back here, it was still a big arch underground. But somebody, kids, had like caved in the top, only about eight feet from the bottom of the chimney. And all as it appeared to be on the floor were like a little puddle of water full of dead leaves and twigs <laughs> and sticks about three inches deep. There were that much greenery on top of it you couldn't tell how deep it How'd was you get out? well that's it i still don't bloody know to this day <laughs> the thing is that i went down this hole and I, and I felt my legs going like that in the arch inside you know I thought, where the bloody hell am i going you know and, and i finally come to you know bottom four foot deep so i'm up to i'm only a short ass character i'm up to here in the bloody water <laughs> The jackhammer over my head, you know, they're only like oh, little. Jackhammer. Oh, yeah, still there with rubber pipe yeah. on, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like a bloody gun, you know. Yeah, but only little ones, you know, like a PC9 oh, right. is oh, about, yeah, the yeah. body's about that big and the chisel's yeah. about that yeah. long. Yeah. So, they, you know, you yeah. can all one up pretty easy. But I'd say about 30, 30 odd pound of iron yeah. altogether, you know. But I'm there with this and I'm struck down the hole and the bloody cracks are coming in the chimney, violent in front of me, oh. eight feet away from here to that bloody can there. I thought, Christ, I'm going to die, you know. And I don't know how I come out that all, come out like one of them bloody torpedoes out of a submarine, you know. One of them rockets, you know, <laughs> with a stream of water leaving me as I come out. And I, and I landed on terra firma and I, I legged it down. I never saw a chimney fall down, you know. It just, boom, I heard the roar behind me. And, and we went back after and the bloody hole had gone, you know. If I'd have, if I'd have like, demobilised myself down the hole, it would just have been a rubber pipe going across the ground and, yeah. you know, just turning down under all this brick, you know. Well, they're dead and gone, like, yeah, yeah. But I made it. I got out of the hole, you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I did, you know. The Dorset Fair at night is one of the most beautiful sights you can see in Great Britain. With old-time ferris wheels and roundabouts, it shows what things used to look like in days gone by. A line of 50 gleaming showman's engines is a sight to be remembered as they generate the electric that powers these old-time rides. This old-time fair really is the showpiece of the great Dorset Steam Fair and people travel from all over the world to enjoy its beauty. Fred likes the old-time fairs and decides to take his wife Sue on the old gallopers. You want me on the bike? <laughs> <laughs> Groucho. Like Groucho Mark. Mm. You are. Ah, this this chimney, it uh, it once belonged to a paper mill, uh, but 
according to neighbours around here, at the older end, like, you know, it shut in 1920s and then became various other things, you know, afterwards. But I often wonder when I were a little lad why this chimney were always bright red and, and you know, never black like all the other ones around here. This is the... When this is gone, there's only one more left in this town when it's gone, this. Like, when we're not sat on tops of chimneys, you know, we spend a great deal of time uh, knocking the things down and, and basically here what we're doing today is we've removed a, a section of the brickwork from the base of the chimney stack and we're replacing that with wooden props and wedges and cap pieces, as you can see. And then when we've removed the, you know, remainder of the brickwork, basically we set fire to the, the timber and uh, down comes the chimney stack. Uh, this method really in confined places compares very favourably with the dynamite men because you don't get bricks blowing out all over the, uh, all over the neighbourhood. Like the hardest thing really is controlling the crowd, you know, because in, in these places, as you can see around here, there's walls sticking up and all sorts of things, and people have a nasty habit of just bobbing up from behind a wall when the thing's about to fall down, which is a bit nasty. You see, when you, when you blow things up, the, the, it's like five, four, three, two, one, boom, and it's all over with, whereas here we've like 20 minutes of... Uh, nerve-wracking thought before the thing actually falls over. Here, we're having a bit of bother getting the fire going. <laughs> so you need a bit of a torch of this nature to, you know, get the, get the wood and all the all the diesel oil and the and the rags going really good because uh, you've got to get it burning fairly uniformly across the front of the chimney stack once you have lit it it's out of your hands then it's uh, in the hands of that guy upstairs you know Uh, not a lot of room here, as you can see. We were all about four feet off one wall and, and we'd knocked it all through a wall to fire the chimney through the hole. Uh, it went very well, actually. We didn't even knock any of the remainder of the walls down. All the wood were wet, it were being particularly stubborn that day, you know, as a rule, it's generally blazing away by now. We didn't do too well, you know. The whole place had burned down the works and the fire brigade had done the bit wetting all the wood through. There we go, it's taking over now quite well. As a rule, it's about quarter of an hour to 20 minutes, I think. I think that one weren't, weren't very far out on that bush. Another one gone. Cloud of dust. Mm. Yeah, it went very well indeed. I'm quite pleased because where the, where the flue all were, where the smoke went in, you see, it were yeah. like sort of two foot of brickwork missing, which we could have done with. Yeah. And, and of course, we propped that up with a big bark of timber and did you see how it twisted round when it when it went you know it, oh yeah it, so well, you it, it actually yeah. rolled round on that piece of wood you know stood on a on a big pin yeah. as you might say oh, you want love nice one, yeah fred dibner is certainly an interesting character he's witty informative and one of the most lovable eccentrics you could ever meet he likes to do things the old way and who can blame him so if you're driving through lancashire keep your eyes on the chimneys as the man on the top enjoying the view might just be Fred Dibner. <laughs>